now we'll start uh, uh, the course on QCD by Giulia Zanderighi. Let me introduce uh, Giulia. Uh, she studied uh, in Milan and got a PhD in uh, Pavia. She was postdoc uh, in Darm, in Fermilab, uh, and uh, at CERN. Uh, she was uh, in, from 2007, she got a lecture in Oxford and a tutorial fellow at uh, Wadham College. Uh, since uh, 2010, she was professor at the University of Oxford uh, and uh, went uh, on leave of absence uh, from 2014 for a five-year staff position at CERN. And since uh, last, uh, last is not last year anymore, since 2019, uh, she's director at Max Planck Munich, uh, Institute in Munich. She's, uh, as you all know, an expert of QCD and collided physics, uh, which is exactly uh, the topic uh, of these lectures. So, uh, Julia, can you share your? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. We can see you. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. So yeah, um, let me see. I follow your instructions. I want to sorry share my tablet. Uh, okay. Um, can you can you see a white screen? Huh? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Yes. So yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to give this lecture. So what I will talk about here is QCD and um, collider physics. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, my name is Julia, and I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Physics. So it's the first time I give lectures using these tools, uh, the Zoom and so on. So I'll, uh, and also using a tablet. So I hope it will work fine. I'm not actually not so sure because my handwriting is really quite horrible. So I, if I'm too slow at the end, I will use more and more maybe slides. And we will see. Um, yeah. So let me start. Julia, Julia, I think something, yeah, something happened with the audio. I don't know if it happened what, what happened okay. before. There was a lag yes, so and we me, couldn't hear you well. Okay, let me try to fix it. Um, I think I know how to fix it. No. Ah, like that. Sure. Can you try to write something? Is it better now the audio or not? Yes, yes. The audio is better. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let's see. This would be and collider physics. Does it work? Huh? Okay. For now it's good. So go ahead. I stop you if there's any problem. Okay, so as you see, my handwriting is really not so great, but sorry about that. There's not much I can do. So uh, let me start by reminding you a little bit of our current colliders. Um, well, really what I mean by that are the colliders that are really relevant for the physics program that we have today. So we have, uh, we had, uh, So we had the lab, as you know, lab and lab two. These were plus and minus machines uh, running between a reserve pool and higher energies. And they ran in the years, uh, let's say, 80, 80 until 2000. Then we had Hira which was an E plus E minus proton machine, a deep elastic scattering experiment. I will cover deep elastic scattering in these lectures quite in detail. And so this is a machine that ran between 92 and about 2007. And we had Tevatron, which was in fact a P, P bar machine. So somewhat like the LHC, but the proton anti-proton machine. This experiment also ran for many years, between 2003 and about 2011. And now we know that we have the LHC. We had first Iran 1, 
So LHC is obviously it's a PP machine. We had a run one at low energy between 2010 and 2012. We had an run two, and this started in 2015 till 2018. And now we are waiting for the run three of this machine. And then we will have a high luminosity program. This is approved and will run now for many years, about 20 years. Mm -hmm. So what is the main legacy of these experiments here? Well, in the plasma uh, at lab, I think really the legacy of these experiments are measurements of masses, couplings, electroweak precision measurements. And some of these measurements are still the best measurements we have today. So I think one can really write somehow a weak electroweak parameters, masses, couplings, and so on. Here are, is a, a lepton on a proton machine. So one would probe the structure of the proton. So here we have proton structure functions, proton structure functions, a PDS, proton distribution functions. Again, I will cover this quite in detail. Tevatron somehow will remain the legacy really measurement is of course the discovery of the top work. And then the first really high energy QCD measurements. And for the LHC, we know that the LHC was somehow designed with this uh, idea that it would either discover the Higgs boson or had to find new physics. We know that the Higgs boson has been discovered, of course, everybody knows. And we know also that new physics is so far a bit elusive at the LHC. Now, with the discovery of the Higgs, this is something that uh, maybe Ricardo will cover more, but uh, we know that the standard model is a complete theory. It's a consistent theory up to really very high energy scales. Uh, what this means is that uh, we have no, no compelling case to see new physics at uh, the next energy scale. On the other hand, we know that it can't be a somehow complete theory because there are many observations that we cannot account for in the standard model. For instance, the presence of dark matter, dark energy, neutrino masses, uh, uh, the hierarchy problem, and so on. On the other hand, we know that these kind of days of guaranteed discoveries at colliders are a bit over. So there is no, no loose theorem. And so I think progress in the coming years will be driven by data, by LHC data for the next, I would say, 20 years. And so how does this, uh, how, how will this work? Well, the LHC program in the coming decades will essentially focus on what we call <coughs> direct searches. This is maybe number one, direct searches. Direct searches. So how does this work here? Well, <coughs> you essentially take a look at some distribution. For instance, you can look at an invariant mass distribution, plot the mass here and the differential cross-section. And uh, so something where the standard model has kind of this shape. And if you have new physics, uh, rises from somehow a little bump in this distribution so that the total spectrum that you see end up, ends up having this kind of shape. This is what we also call bump hunting at the LHC looking for this kind of excesses where you directly produce a new particle, the new particle decays, and uh, yeah, you see this kind of uh, excesses. For this type of searches, one should say that QCD and everything I will tell you is not particularly relevant, right? Because you really see, you just have to do a counting experiment if you see a bump. But then the other important thing will be indirect searches, indirect searches. And here again, you look at some distributions, and as an example, one could look at a PT, transverse momentum, for instance, distribution, or really different observables. Again, you look at the differential cross section. <clears throat> and here, typically, standard model falls like this. At high PT, the cross section becomes smaller. This is the standard model. And when you include new physics effects, uh, what happens is that at low PT you agree very well, but then you have a somehow an excess at high PT. Now this uh, <clears throat> indirect searches, maybe Ricardo again will cover this, but 
these are somehow much more difficult to to account for and to somehow really establish in order to really sorry he didn't draw this very nicely but this of course uh, you have a shape that still drops uh, but you have an excess uh, so one somehow drops sharper than the other one and to establish such a deviation to establish this deviation you really have to be able to quantify your standard model prediction and those account for it so the deviation that you establish must be um, larger than your theoretical uncertainty in your prediction and this is where really qcd comes into play so this uh, standard model prediction actually has a band and you can uh, definitely say that there is a in a deviation if uh, this discrepancy is larger than your theoretical uncertainty in other words the more you reduce your theoretical uncertainty the more you're sensitive to this type of deviation so the third really <clears throat> the third somehow way to look for new physics is what we call consistency checks huh? consistency tests of the standard model and here so let me remove this one here what you do what you can for instance so these two are sort of related uh, but here, for instance, you can take standard model parameters like, say, the mass of the top, the mass of the W, and the mass of the Higgs. Huh? And in the standard model, somehow these parameters are not independent. So they have to be aligned on that. This, somehow the measurement has to be on this line. Now we know the mass of the Higgs here, 125 GV. So if by measuring very precisely the top mass and the W mass, you would find that you somehow lie here, then you would definitely say that, that somehow things are not consistent. There is an inconsistency that can be attributed to uh, physics effects. So again, and these extractions of parameters uh, really rely on having theoretical predictions that are very precise. And this is somehow where QCD really enters. Now, to give you an example, here I have an example. What I'm showing here are the, how well one can measure the couplings of the Higgs, huh? two different standard model particles. In fact, what we really measure are somehow the deviations of this coupling. This kappa indicate essentially a, so for instance, kappa to a given particle, and we call it X. If you want this measurement of the coupling as extracted from data, let's say, divided by the standard model prediction. And what is shown here is how much, uh, how much data can constrain this type of coupling, so, or how much one expects uh, to constrain these couplings after the high luminosity LHC run. So really, after you see running with uh, 14, uh, 14 dB at high luminosity. Now, what you see is here you can see the different uncertainties that you have. You have, uh, from an experimental point of view, you have statistical uncertainties. You also have experimental uncertainties here in green. But you see that many of these measurements are dominated by theory, theoretical uncertainties. So, really, in this case, uh, theoretical uncertainties mostly really means that you see the uncertainties. So one of the big uh, goals of the coming years is to really reduce this uncertainties, uh, QCD uncertainties. Um, so I think the, somehow the scope of uh, these lectures will be to somehow explain a little bit more how these predictions are derived and so on. And the goal is really what one has to think is that QCD is a way to really sharpen your tools to get more accurate predictions. Uh, and so that improves sensitivity to new physics effects. So let me say somehow the purpose somehow or the goal of this lecture will be first really to give you an introduction on QCD, introduction to QCD. I mean, for those that know QCD already very well, you should see somehow a way to refresh your knowledge of QCD. What I really want to do is to somehow introduce basic concepts uh, that uh, essentially you will see appear over and over again when you discuss QCD, like issues of infrared divergences, large logarithms, and so on. And yeah, this is kind of related to really understand uh, the terminology that we use. 
And uh, at the end, I will really try to cover recent developments in the field, uh, recent developments, and really try to explain where are we now and what are the goals uh, as of today. Okay. So, now I would like to start uh, by reminding you of how things start in QCD. Now we know QCD is the first on interaction. How did it start? Well, the beginning of QCD was really understanding that one could take the hadrons as observed. So, for instance, here you see the neutron, the neutron, the proton. You see this the neutron, the proton, and so on. And people understood that you could organize the hadrons in a somehow symmetric, following some symmetric patterns. In fact, uh, at the beginning, uh, people did this and they realized that uh, something was missing. This uh, state was not really seen at first. And uh, somehow they could postulate the predict the existence of this state uh, by so simply following the pattern observed here. Right? So you see that here, hadrons are organized according to their quantum numbers, if you want, the charges and so on. And of course, the question is, what is the origin of this pattern? And uh, yeah, Gendan and Spike proposed the existence of um, elementary spin one half particles, the quarks. And at the beginning, they thought there were three quarks, up, down, and strange, and the antiparticles. And with these three particles, they could explain essentially all states uh, as you see them here. So for instance, this particle here is made of up, up, up. This one would be made of up, up, down, up, down, 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 and so on. And here you introduce a strange quark and so on. So they could explain all uh, quarks. Huh? And now, okay, first, uh, there was a problem related to this existence of this type of particles, up, 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 or down, 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 which had to do with the fact that uh, this was a particle which has a symmetric spatial wave function and somehow had quarks in the same spin state. So without the introduction of an additional quantum number, this uh, Three, the existence of this particle would uh, violate the Pauli's uh, exclusion principle. And this is how color was introduced. So color was introduced to really solve this spin statistics problem. And this particle, this delta plus plus, essentially can then be written in this way. Delta plus plus can be written as some epsilon ijk, ui, uj, uk. Yeah, this really, this uh, index here is the index related to the um, color quantum number. I think this is the anti-symmetric tensor. So this was somehow the indirect, uh, if you want, uh, first evidence for color. The more direct evidence came by the direct evidence came by looking, by looking at the so-called R ratio. So let me define what the R ratio is. R ratio is defined essentially as a cross-section, or can be thought as a counted experiment, E plus E minus, so you collide the plus E minus, and look how many times this goes into hadrons, divided by the same cross section for E plus B minus to E plus B minus. Okay. So if we write this down at low energy, draw how this can happen, so E plus B minus, at low energy center you have only a photon. So this is B minus B plus, Minus, plus, or here you can have in plus or minus, or you can have q q bar. Okay. So you see that this is mediated by essentially a QED interaction only. So the diagram, if you produce me plus or minus or a q q bar state, is all essentially the same. And now, if, of course, if you have three quarts rather than just one, then the cross section would be proportional to that number. So this is essentially proportional to the number of colors that you have, the number of types you have quarks, times 
the sum of all zeros that you can have times the charges, elementary charges squared. And the essential experimental data really confirmed, so experimental data confirmed that the number of colors is only equal to three. I will show you later this measurement, how this looks like and so on. Now, okay, there is a side remark that I would like to make here. So here, I defined this R ratio as E plus E minus two hadrons. And then I told you, well, to some approximation, we can approximate it by the, the photon going to Q, Q bars, somehow at lowest order perturbations here in TCU. And there is a question of why this is a good approximation. Like, I don't know if somebody wants to reply to this or somebody knows using the raised hand feature why this actually works very well. No? Let's see if somebody wants to comment on this. I cannot see this. Okay, so let me tell you why. So this scattering happens at the center of mass energy. Let's call this field Q. And uh, you know very well that we do not observe quarks, but what we see are only hadrons, colorless final states. And the point is that this scattering can be is a somehow high energy scattering. So Q is somehow much larger than the typical scale at which hadronization happens. And so if that is the case, so when two physical phenomena happen at very different energy scales, then they somehow are, um, they don't interfere with each other. And so some of the low energy, so low energy related to this, uh, to the hadronization of physics, uh, cannot really have a large effect on the high energy perturbative physics related to this picture. So this is why some of this perturbative picture of using quarks uh, really actually works at colliders. And, um, yeah, so at the end, this color becomes some of the charge of strong interaction. And uh, what we know now today is that the interaction is so strong that uh, we only observe uh, color index states. Uh, and uh, all the quarks are always combined in this uh, color symmet fields. Uh, so I would like to have some feedback here. Can you follow? I, I have a question so far. I didn't say much in the very conceptual, but uh, is everything fine? Can you follow? Can you read what I write? I hope so. I, I think everything is... Uh, everything is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, they write uh, on the chart uh, the follow. They can follow. Okay, very good. Yeah. It, it's... Uh, it's a bit frustrating to talk to the computer for a long time with no. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let me write now to QCD. Now we know that, okay, QCD is a gauge theory, no? Sorry. QCD. We know it's a gauge theory based, gauge theory based on this group SU3, SUN with N equal 3. And this means that uh, SU3 means uh, unitary, that is, it says essentially obey this relation, U, U, dial equal 1, and the, the determinant of this matrices has to be equal to 1. Okay. So in essence, so by the point is that if you assume that this is, uh, that you have this gauge theory, what, what happens is that you really can explain all the hadron spectrum by saying that hadrons are made of these P one half quarks, uh, that there is each quark of a given flavor comes in three colors, uh, and that this SU3 is an exact symmetry. And, um, yeah, and hadrons are all color neutral, so color singlets under this SU3 group. And one can also easily show that from the fact that they are color neutral, it also follows that all the hadrons must have an integer charge. Right? And uh, we classify essentially all hadrons into two. So we have mesons. that are essentially described by, if you want to write it explicitly, um, 
somehow quark anti quark states. Uh, and now you see that if you if you change, if you rotate uh, the state, the psi, you trans, if you transform psi into u psi, here what is uh, you will get essentially psi. So if you transform this, you see psi transforms into u psi, psi dagger transforms into psi dagger, psi bar, psi bar u dagger. And so u u dagger here changes. So this state remains exactly the same. So this becomes, uh, uh, okay, remains a psi dagger psi. And baryons, also baryons are essentially combinations of three quark states. Variants uh, can be written explicitly into some i, j, k, psi, i. So you have the anti-symmetric tensor i, j, k, as I showed before, psi, i, psi, j, psi, k. And now again, if you rotate this, uh, you get, uh, and we're writing now explicitly, i, i prime, j, j prime, k, k prime. And then you get epsilon i j k u i i prime u j j prime u k k prime um, psi i prime psi j prime psi so psi k prime and then you can essentially see that this uh, this sum over I prime, J prime, K prime, or sorry, I, J, K, can be essentially written. This is the definition of the determinant. So this becomes a sign of I prime, J prime, K prime, the determinant of U times epsilon I prime, J prime, K prime, psi I prime, psi J prime, psi K prime. And so because this is one, you see that the state remains invariant. Right. So I'm a, uh, Writing explicitly something really trivial if you want. Yeah. So these are some of the only hadrons we know today, uh, mesons and variants, made up of this type of combinations of color units. Now I uh, would like to say something about uh, some, the mass spectrum. And here, let me use a little bit slides uh, because I think it's a bit nicer. Now, what we know today is that we have six quarks. So we know the quantum numbers in terms of electrical charge. These are two thirds and minus one third in units of the electric charge. We know the masses. And in essence, we have two very light quarks here, the up and down, very light. The strange is also very light. Charm becomes a bit more heavy, one point, around 1.5 GeV. And bottom and top are about 5 and 172 uh, kg. So, so this, uh, this is what we know today of the spectrum. But of course, at the beginning, it was different. At the beginning, people knew only about, uh, or sort of first postulated the existence of up, down, and strange quarks. As I told you, this uh, explained the hydrospectrum, spectrum. But there was at the first no direct evidence. The first really direct evidence for quarks that the quarks exist as really, if you want, physical states inside the proton, uh, not just an artifact to describe the protons, came from these uh, deeper acid scattering experiments. So deeper acid scattering, I will, uh, we will come back to this also later, but essentially what is, you do, you, you take a proton here, can be this one, and you collide an electron on it. So you have a, an exchange of the photon. This photon is somehow probes the structure of the proton. And if you have fundamental quarks, the scattering of the um, scattering of the outgoing electron when it hits uh, one of these fundamental particles is really some very large, uh, large angle scattering. And so this uh, the existence of this light quarks was really validated by experimental slack. Yes, slack. Was the first somehow in uh, about uh, 68, uh, the existence of quarks as uh, a sort of really physical states, if you want. 
And uh, of course, uh, the, the existence of the strange also was important to explain cosmic rays and so on. No? The charming state, that once you see that you have three states, you can start organizing states and generations. But the charm was, um, um, sorry, charm was somehow seen as a, um, indirect, if you want, first. So by studying this type of uh, oscillation experiment. So you can take a kaon, it's simply a barrier that contains a D and has a spar. And this state can oscillate into a k-bar state. And now you essentially have, uh, you can compute in the Fermi effective theory this type of oscillation, that you have up quarks running in this loop. And without, uh, without a charm state, you would have very large contributions. So charm was needed to somehow cancel the up contribution of these loops. Uh, and the leftover is then uh, somehow suppressed, it's proportional to the charm mass over the W mass, so, and also the sine squared of this angle. So, Charm was somehow postulated in the 70s by Glasho, Iopoulos, and Miami to, to somehow explain the absence of this flavor change in neutral currents. And later only it was somehow seen more directly. You see here, it was seen as a bound state of a CC bar, a CC bar bound state that then can decay. It was observed independently. This was then in 74. It was observed both at SLAC and at PNL. And the two uh, collaborations gave different names to this. They called it the J and Psi. And so now the CC bar bound state is what we now call the J Psi particle because of that. And here you also see why this was called psi, because somehow the decays in this event is played they somehow form uh, something that really looks like a psi here. And uh, we know that the Nobel Prize, uh, okay, Nobel uh, in, uh, sorry, Nobel Prize uh, in uh, 76 uh, for the discovery of the CC bus. Okay. And then let me come to the third generation or so the bottom uh, were really a third generation, not just one quote, but was somehow um, postulated by Kobayashi and Maskawa. And here we are in the year 73. Kobayashi, Kobayashi. So they postulated the existence of a third generation of quotes to so account for CP violation in the standard model. You know that if you don't have a third generation, you cannot have CP violation. And uh, this, we also know that this, in fact, it's a Nobel Prize uh, in uh, 2008. And again, so the B quark uh, here, you see how the B quark can be seen from it. Now, this was one of the, what I would call in my first, uh, what I called before is a direct search. You look at the mass spectrum here, and you see that at the mass of around, uh, uh, the mass of the BD bar state, so around 10 GB, you see a little bump in the distribution. And this was precisely this Y, the bound state of BD bar. And uh, finally, for the top quark, well, the top is much, much heavier than the other one. So it uh, took really a long time, long, long time to see it uh, directly. The first uh, evidence for top was really indirect. Again, very similar to the story of the charm. You can look at oscillation of PB bar, and you can compute this now. You see that uh, now, before I wrote an effective diagram where the W was integrated out, I had this four point interaction for a frame interaction. Here I write the whole, uh, draw the full diagram in the standard model with the W and the top result. And you see that by measuring this oscillation, this depends on the top mass. So one can extract bounds on the top mass. And the first bounds were that the top was supposed to be larger than 50 GB or so. And this at the time was already a surprise eh? because uh, all our quotes were much lighter. What happened later is that at LEP, uh, also LEP somehow provided very strong constraints on the top. 
How was that? So lab didn't have enough energy to produce uh, the plastic vinyls to Kitiba directly. We know that the highest energies of lab were about 200 GV, and you need more than 300 to produce the bounce, to produce a Kitiba state. However, lab measured, for instance, this type of degree Z boson going to the bar, and you see that the top through these loop corrections affects uh, this uh, production of Z to the bar. Or even simply the propagator of the z boson is affected by this type of diagrams. So by measuring very precisely the, these processes and by computing these loop effects, the lab could provide bounds. And uh, somehow the most conservative bounds from lab are, were about something like that the top was supposed to be kind of in this window. And this was, of course, then very helpful when uh, the Teverton experiment switched on, they knew exactly where to look for a top quark and they could then uh, discover a top quark very, very quickly. So Teverton turned on in 93 and really, or 94, and in 95, uh, there was a discovery of the top by CDF, uh, CDF and PC. So this is one of the main uh, really results of uh, the Teverton. And now we know the top mass really very precisely with uh, 500 mg or so uncertainty. Okay, so this is somehow the spectrum as we know it today. We know that uh, what, so we know we have three generations. This, uh, this is all we have in terms of meta content of QCD. We know this precisely. But one of the big questions is why, why does the spectrum have this? Why is it like that? In particular, why is the top much heavier than all the other states? This is something we don't have an answer to. And this is one of the big questions we have today. The other thing to say is that, as you see, there is really a difference between this kind of three light quarks or sometimes four light quarks. Often they are treated as massless because their mass is really so tiny that it has a, essentially no effect of collider experiments. And uh, yeah, now that we have, uh, I told you how this uh, spectrum looks and uh, how this is, uh, we can go back to this R ratio. So this was the quantity that I told you was relevant to determine the color quantum number, the first really direct evidence for color. And let me remind you, so R, this R ratio, somehow the lowest order in perturbative QCD is the number of colors times the sum of the charges squared. And now you can measure this R as a function of the energy of your collider, of the plus minus machine. And essentially, if you are at low energy, you, you don't have enough uh, energy to produce a top, obviously, or even bottom. So at lowest energy, you're sensitive only to up, down, and strange. And so in essence, you have essentially only three quarks here. And then you can easily see that if you put in the charges here, you get that R is equal to two. Once you increase the energy and cause the pressure to produce a charm as well, then you essentially you have four flavors. And then you see that there is a jump. Here you get R equal to 10 over three. In essence, all you have to do is uh, include the charm and uh, take into account that this has a uh, charge two over three. Then you see here, close to the top threshold here, you see that there is a little jump. This jump is very small because uh, the bottom has charged one, one third, so if you square it, it's one ninth. So it's really a small difference here. So R becomes, uh, from this 10 over 3, you have to add 3 times 1 over 9, so this becomes 11 over 3. But you see clear, very clearly these thresholds, right? That you cross here, this is the charm threshold here, and so on. So this is, um, so the other thing I would like to say here, maybe one word, one is wondering what, what are all these uh, structures here. These are of course resonances that you have. Uh, and uh, they are essentially non perturbative bound states, but uh, you always see that you reach uh, plateaus uh, in this R ratio where you, when you are away from these thresholds. So. And of course R again, if you cross the top threshold again, that changes. Uh, 
So this is everything I wanted to say in terms of the meta content of QCD, essentially the, the core sector. And I would like now to discuss a little bit the gauge part of the theory. But maybe it's a, I'll, uh, it's a good moment to ask if there are questions. Huh? Um, I don't know where I see the. Are there any questions? Then? No. Okay. So, anyway, if there is any raise the hand or I see any question while you're talking, I'll, I'll stop you. So, there is one in the chat, actually. Oh, I don't know. I don't see it. Okay. You, you want me to read it or you just open the chat if you chat. go on Zoom chat, okay. where you can open the participant the list. Between, uh, the number, between the number of generation NCD violation. Okay, so if you would have only, so the question is uh, the connection between number of generation CD violation. So if one has only two generations, so to have CT violation, one needs a complex case in, the, in this, uh, this making system. And if you have uh, only two generations, you can only sort it this way. So you need three generations to have CT violation in the standard model. This is something that I, it's more, um, I don't know if this will be covered really in the DSM lecture so to explicitly. Well, we can discuss this in the, um, in a discussion session. But in essence, if you would have only two generations, you couldn't, could not have any CT evaluation in the standard model at all. No? And we know experimentally that CT evaluation, there is CT evaluation in the standard model. That's why you need three generations. So. Okay. Julia, your audio is a bit worse. Maybe you have put something on the microphone because it looks like the microphone is a bit. Uh, uh... I know maybe you just have a piece of paper on the mic or something, something like that. No, it, no, like, uh, it was a bit worse than before. Is it okay now? Yes, yes, I think it's okay. 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 So. Um, let me continue now. I would like to discuss a little bit the really the gauge part of, uh, of the theory. So a bit slow, I'm not familiar with all this. Uh, so now to discuss the gauge structure of QCD, I would like to start by also really recording a little bit QAD. So the thing is that QAD and QCD, in terms of the gauge set, are to some extent really very, very similar. No? So, in, uh, in uh, QCD, we have quarks, uh, and in uh, QD, we have electrons. So they are really kind of the same, only we know that we have three quarks uh, rather than we have only one electron for a given number In QCD, we have the uh, ones, and QD, we have photons. And again, they are the mediators of the interaction. In, uh, we will see in QCD, we have many ones, in QD, we have only one photon. And the big difference between the two theories is that uh, in QCD, gluons interact with themselves. And this uh, will come on. I will show you how this comes into Kilogram. And, and this is what really we will see is uh, really makes the behavior of the two theories in the ultraviolet and infrared really very different. Um, and uh, the other thing to somehow keep in mind, both uh, at collider experiments are uh, sort of perturbative interactions. Perturbative means that the coupling constant is small, we can use this language of uh, lead transport and for proton gluons. But really, while uh, we always think of the coupling in QAD as uh, if you want one over 37 or one over 128 or 37 mass, the coupling in QCD at, uh, say, the Z mass. Sorry, Julia. Yeah. There is some problem with audio. After you answer the question, uh, it's more like Eovattato. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but. Uh, uh, so, I, can... I don't know if, if it's, uh, I mean, uh, just, can try to see, uh... just something obstructing the microphone, like, uh, yeah. I don't know, you have moved the computer or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
Is it better now? Y yes, probably a bit better. Better or worse? I mean, no, no, better, better. better. And now? Yes, better. Better. Okay, so maybe, I don't know, when I click on the check, something happened. But, uh, now it's better? Yeah, it's like before. It's, uh, it's fine now, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, so as I said, I mean, the two theories to some extent are very similar. And when we write the Lagrangians, uh, you see they're very similar, but then at the end, they turn out very, to be very different. The other thing I wanted to say is that QCD at the end, uh, we call it strong interaction because uh, the coupling in QCD, what we see alpha or G, mm -hmm. is somehow stronger than the Q, QED coupling. Often we think about it, uh, um, the, sorry, the coupling in QCD is proportional to the, so this is what we think often, that uh, the, this is about 0 0.1 and this is about uh, one over 100. So the coupling QCD squared is, of, is uh, of the same order of QED interactions. In other words, when you want to compute precision at colliders, the most important calculations you have to do are QCD calculations. When you go to higher orders in QCD, then you also have to account for QED or electroweak effects. But now, yeah, I would like to start by somehow writing down maybe the Lagrangians, maybe that's just like this. Let me write down the QED Lagrangian. So the QED Lagrangian, sorry, I mean, everybody, probably everybody knows, but let me remind you. QED Lagrangian has this very simple form. You have essentially a Dirac part, I P slash minus N of psi. You have F mu F mu. And then you have the coupling of, of the leptons to the, to the electromagnetic field. Right? So essentially this one, this is our electromagnetic vector potential. This here is our field strength tensor that one can write, can write as essentially F mu equal P mu A mu minus P mu A mu, the field strength. And then uh, one can typically combine the derivative and uh, the interaction into what is uh, a covariant derivative. So this can also be written as d mu minus m psi minus half f mu f mu, where this one here, this is what we call uh, the covariant derivative. This is uh, explicitly d mu is the normal derivative plus contains this. Yeah, this is something you probably have seen many times and, uh, and so on. So once you have uh, the Lagrangian in QCD, in QAD, you can then from there derive Feynman rules. Uh, and uh, let me just sketch as an example, no? you can, uh, for instance, uh, derive from, uh, I don't know how to do it, let's see, from this term here, Right. You can derive the propagator of uh, in this color. You can derive the propagator for a free electron, right? Obviously, psi, psi bar. This has a momentum p and the mass m. And you essentially take uh, i times the inverse of the bilinear theorem in the Lagrangian, and this gives you the propagator, which I write now, for instance, in this form. And this is then the same as you have in, uh, in QCD. This here, really nothing happens. Uh, from this term here, the one that uh, I marked in this color here, this one, uh, you can uh, derive the interaction of the electron to the photons. Uh, so like this. And this is essentially, you simply have to read off the term that contains uh, this three field, uh, psi bar, Psi, psi bar, mm -hmm. and so here the final rule simply tells you that this is uh, the factors of i, i, e, gamma, mu, and so on. And similarly, you can derive the propagator for the photon field and so on. 
once, once you have your final rules, you can essentially compute amplitudes perturbed between QED by combining, uh, drawing all Feynman diagrams that you have and computing amplitudes from uh, the Feynman diagrams. Now, the QED Lagrangian has a somehow really important property, which is called gauge invariance. So, so the Q, so gauge invariance So gauge invariance is a symmetry, but it's not a symmetry um, related to sort of a conserved quantity. It's essentially a redundancy in a, when we write down the Lagrangian, we, we have a freedom to change our states in such a way that the physics is uh, unaffected. Concretely for the QED Lagrangian, we can take a field of psi and change it in this way alpha of x, psi of x, and at the same time change the a new fields in this form. So one can, it, it is a trivial exercise so to check that if you perform this transformation on your fields, the QD Lagrangian is invariant under this uh, transformation. So this is really a trivial exercise I will leave it to you to do it. And now in, uh, in uh, no, uh, 1954, Young Mills essentially said that this uh, concept of local invariance or local phase rotation in technique could be generalized to invariance under continuous symmetries for really more generic uh, gauge theories. And this, in fact, is a crucial property of QCD as well. So now let me come to the QCD Lagrangian. Now, if you want to write the QCD Lagrangian, write it. So the QCD Lagrangian, essentially, we can write it now in this form. Let me write it in this form. This is. Uh, So, in that sense, you see the, Q, the QCD Lagrangian has essentially the same form as the QD Lagrangian, it only at the end has more indices and has one more important difference. So, you see again, this is some of the part of the new field strength, and this is the covariant derivative. Now, here the covariant derivative, you see, has these indices ij. And explicitly, it is again a derivative and contains, now we write a delta j, I will see what this means. Then uh, it has this term containing the field strength. Okay, so this is now our covariant derivative. So this delta, so we see that now, um, well, okay, you see all these extra indices. So what, what are these indices? Here there is an index F, and this is the flavor of the quark, up, down, and so on. This index I and J is now the color index. We know there are three colors. So this delta here means essentially propagation of a quark, which does not change color. And then you see instead that when a quark interacts with a gluon, it changes uh, its color. So there is a color matrix PA with the indices IJ, and this uh, somehow rotates the color of the system. But this is uh, what uh, was before our covariant derivative, this one here. And then we have a field strength, uh, and this is now also slightly different. F mu now has, as before, a d mu a mu. Now this carries a color index A, 
again with the color index A. And now the big difference really with respect to QCD is somewhat the presence of this term here. This one and the market. So this one here. You see that now in the field strength, there are terms that contain two, uh, two, two vector potentials. What this means is when you square it in the Lagrange, and you will see that you will have terms with three or four of these fields, and this gives rise to three and four point interactions in a QCD. Okay. So in essence, if you look at this Lagrange, and you see that there is in fact only one parameter in this theory. This is this GS here. Yeah. So QCD is a theory with one single parameter. We have quark masses as well, but quark masses have an electronic origin. So some of they don't, they're not really parameter, fundamental parameters. And uh, yeah, so as I said, these are the terms that create the self interaction between the ones. And uh, these are what uh, these are these color matters. As we see, these are some of the generators of the group as you free. And they have a somehow property of this Lagrangian is that this uh, flavor blind uh, by this uh, well means that okay, the, this, uh, these terms are independent of the flavor. All the differences uh, come from electronic theory, but QCD does not uh, really differentiate between different flavors. So now let me come to the how am I doing this time? I, I have another half hour. Yes. If you want to stop five minutes, I don't know, or you want to finish. Yeah, so let's see. we have questions so far. I, I don't you think can I stop think. a few minutes uh, before five. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there are no questions in the chat so far. N not, not, not no ones. Okay, so. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe I'm going a little bit too slow, but uh, I think it's uh, it's okay for the first lecture to be a bit slow. So QCD, we said it's a gauge group with uh, SU3. We said that the gauge group is SUN with N equal 3. Uh -huh. Now, if you want to count how many generators this group ha has, uh, we know that an N times N complex matrix has, in general, uh, N squared complex entries. Uh, so it means two n squared, uh, some independent values that one can write in such a matrix. Now, when you impose the condition of unitarity, u, u, dagger, u, u, dagger, u equal one, these are n squared relations. And then if you impose also that the determinant of u is equal to one, this is one more relation. This means that you are left with two n squared minus n squared plus one constraints. So n squared minus one independent uh, generators of the group. So this group has n squared minus one generators. Concretely, one can write these matrices in this form e to the i x ta, where these ta's are the matrices that we are here in the Lagrangian. And uh, these a's are n times n traceless, so let me write it. A are n times n traceless permission matrices. Where this A goes between 1 and n squared minus 1. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Concretely, I want to show you here one representation of this matrix here. So, one representation is uh, due to Gelman. So this, uh, what I write here, the so-called Gelman matrices. Gelman matrices. They are related to uh, to this TA matrices by this very simple relation. TA is simply one half lambda. Really. So this is just a normalization issue. But you see that, uh, you see explicitly that these matrices are this eight, so n squared minus one, eight, they are traceless. If you take the trace of any of these matrices, you get zero. If you sum up the elements on any diagonal, you get zero. And, um, and they are Hermitian, as you see. Now, they also be a standard normalization, or the Gelman, or let me write it now for the, uh, 
TA matrix. It's a standard normalization. is as follows. That the trace of two of these matrices, TA to B, is equal to a given number TR times delta AB, where this TR, the normalization, seems to be one half. Okay. And I will explain that. Now we'll come to explaining a little bit of this color algebra, what this means. Um, the other thing to notice is that, as you see, this is SU3 group, uh, and it somehow generalizes the SU2 group. So here, you see, sorry. This, uh, okay. So you see that these are the power matrices here. Right. Um, yeah. Now, when you have a group, uh, one of the fundamental properties is the so-called uh, infinitesimal transformation, the, commutate, the commutation of two, two matrices. So what, uh, what one can do is take the commutator, let's say, <clears throat> of two of these matrices. Let me, before you spot, let me write it. What one can do is take a commutator of these two and then also expand it. These matrices are e to the i something, i theta or i delta here t a. And uh, you, you can expand this to first order. So this the commutator, you know, this is uh, u delta one, u delta two, minus u delta two, u delta one. And if you expand to first order, you get that this is something i, u, i delta one delta two T A commutator of T B. Right. So you see that essentially because uh, this commutator is non-zero, you can verify it explicitly if you take this matrices, then uh, somehow these uh, transformations, uh, they don't commute. So this is a non-abelian group. No? And you are familiar with, uh, for instance, all rotations are non-abelian transformations. So this is a non-abelian group. No? Now, okay, this uh, commutator is on zero. However, the trace of it is zero. So the trace of the ATB is obviously zero because uh, this is TATB minus TBTA, but you know that you can commute matrices inside the trace. What this means is that you can express TA, TB, as a, because this is traceless, uh, you can express this as a linear combination of uh, this matrices T and uh, with coefficients that will depend on A and B. So let me write it now in this form. This is equal to F, A, B, C, T, C. Right. So this means that these are coefficients. You see that they have to be anti-symmetric. This is uh, anti-symmetric. So this uh, is a coefficient that is anti-symmetric in A and B. And here you're summing over TC. You're writing this as a linear combination of these T matrices. Um, now, these FABCs are what are called structure constants of the group, and they somehow generate a joint algebra of the group. Now, as I said, this is anti symmetric in A and B, but it's also easy to show that this is a fully anti symmetric thing. So, for instance, what you can do is you can um, multiply this by. Um, say a different matrix, say TB, and take a trace. So you get TA TB times the matrix TB and take a trace. And this has to be equal to IFABC TCTB and a trace. And now we know that this is nothing but one half of the delta CB. And so this is uh, I over two F A B D. Right. And now here you see that you can commute this, uh, you can easily see that this is now anti-symmetric in all indices. So essentially this is now a fully anti-symmetric tensor that you have, this F A B C. And uh, so now, just in terms of color, one can write. Uh, so when if we write a delta, so the delta that you had in the Lagrangian, sorry, let me write it. Mm -hmm. 
So the delta that I had in the Lagrangian really means that you have a fermion that comes in and the same fermion goes out and the, the nothing happens. So these eyes go between one and three. For gluons, somehow conventionally we use these letters A and B. And here also it's a delta, but it's a delta in the adjoint representation. So here these indices A and B run between one and this n squared minus one. And then we have this, uh, we wrote this trace of T A equals zero. I want to show you what this means. First thing equals zero means essentially this, that you have color that comes in and nothing goes out. And so this is, so trace means that you take the matrix and close the loop. So this is what this means in a somehow illustration. Now the normalization of matrices is a trace of the APD. Sorry. When we wrote that the trace of the APD is proportional to the identity, it means that you have to color A coming in, then there is Trace. So here there is the matrix TAIJ, and here there is the matrix, so here there is TAIJ, and here I have the matrix TBJI. And when I trace, I somehow, I must get conservation of color. So I get a number, the normalization is what it is, but then I must get the delta of the And uh, for instance, when we write this, So this with this T A I J. One can really think about it somehow in this form. Sorry. So here there is a quark. And somehow this quark has a color like this. The other quark has a different color. So somehow these blue ones, if you want, have the effect of repainting, changing it. The, the blue ones carry color and the color point in number, they repaint the quarks, right? And this is what this TA stands for. And the same happens, of course, when you have uh, the, some of the free gluon vertex. This somehow really mixes these indices of the gluons, and this is somehow. So these are somehow the color, the Feynman rules in terms of just color only for this. Uh, now, there is one uh, really important identity that is called the Fiat's identity. It's, uh, so the Fiat's identity is something that appears here in terms of color, but uh, it also appears in other contexts. So I would like now to tell you what, uh, show you what this identity is uh, and also derive it. So first, let me simply draw the identity. The identity is simply like this. If you have quarks, you have essentially a quark and an antiquark that exchange a gluon. In terms of color, it is identical to having the quark that preserves the color like that. So this minus one over two n. Some of the color was left in this direction. So you see this when I draw a line, now I mean a delta. So this and this now have the same color, this and this, uh, this and this have the same color, and here those two have the same color as so, well. Yeah. So now if we write the identity, this means that uh, so here this is a matrix, you see, this is a matrix TA, and here it's also a matrix TA with some indices. <clears throat> Let me call it here. I, K, and here, I, so this is I, this is K, and here I write, say, J, L, um, J, L, and this becomes a delta, this becomes, a, so then I write T, A, I, K, T, A, J, L equal one half. This is a delta I L and this one here. And this is a delta KJ minus one over two N. 
this becomes this line here becomes a delta i k and this becomes a delta l g. Why is this identity really important and really fundamental? Because once you compute perturbative diagrams and so on, you have, in terms of color, let's forget about loops and stuff, but in terms of color, you have to simplify these diagrams. And you see that it allows you to simplify something that has a gluon exchange to something that does not involve any gluon exchange. So this is really a fundamental, fundamental identity written here. And it holds also similar identities when you compute spinners and other stuff. So how does one prove this identity? <clears throat> Let me try to prove it now. So essentially what you can do is you say, I take any matrix now that is a three times three matrix and I can write it as the identity with some coefficient plus a linear combination of these traceless matrices, TAs. If these are complex numbers, so this is a, I can certainly express any matrix M in this form. Now I can also somehow say something about these coefficients generally. For instance, if I take the trace of this relation, I get that the trace of M is equal to C0, the trace of the identity is nothing but it's a sum of one, one, one. So this is n, the number of colors, three. And here I get nothing because the trace of t is zero. So I get that c zero is the trace of n over n. And now I can take this relation and multiply it by another matrix and I call it p, t, and again I take the trace. Now you will see that on this side I get the trace of m t b. Here I get nothing because it, from this term, because the trace of TB is zero. And so I get CA times the trace of TA TB. But we said that this trace is one half delta AB, so I get one half CB. So I, I say that CB now I know, sorry, CB is two times the trace of MTB. Okay, so so far I have not done anything. Right? Let me maybe. Oh, no, let me. So let me write it now here. M, at this point, I simply put this in. I can say that M is the trace of M over N times the identity plus two times the trace of M T A times my matrix TA, whereas here I'm summing over all these A's. Okay, so so far I have done essentially nothing. Now, sorry. okay, now I make a choice. So I make a choice of matrices, of these matrices here. So I choose matrices that have this form. And I choose many matrices such that the index ij, so element ij of these matrices, matrix k, matrix L, is a delta ik delta jl. So what does this mean? I make different choices such that the matrix always is zero everywhere and has a one so in a, in a given position determined by these deltas. So in essence, these matrices have a sort of like this, uh, give the one in different positions. <clears throat> okay, so what happens when I trace the, uh, when I take the trace of this matrix? You immediately see that uh, the trace will be zero or one. It will be, one only if this one is along the diagonal, otherwise it will be zero. And the trace of MTA instead, what it does is it takes, <coughs> picks the element TA of the matrix, MTA picks this element, and then again it will be, um, yeah, we get the element TA element IJ. So if we essentially take this relation now and write it explicitly. So I put now these deltas in here, I get the delta 
I, now let me remove this uh, brackets, they are irrelevant. This will be one over n. So this one, uh, so this is the element ij. So this one is a delta ij, this one. And this uh, will be one only if uh, k is equal to l. So this will be uh, delta kl. And then I get plus two times this uh, is the element I, T A I J. And here I get the element T A element K L. Okay. Now you see that essentially if I take this relation, this one, and solve for T A, I really essentially obtain this field's identity as written up here. I don't know if you could follow this. I mean, otherwise maybe you can think a little bit about this and we can discuss this a bit more. But um, yeah, at the end it's a matter essentially of decomposing this, uh, this matrices in this form. Now, once you have the fiat identity, let me for instance show you what you can do with this. I mean, maybe I can go back here. So this is the fiat identity. So what I can do, for instance, is I can always close lines in this identity here, right? Like this. Okay. So if I close this line, so closing a line essentially means putting a delta, delta kj, saying that this has to be the same here and here, right? So this then, let me, I'm, I will draw it here. What this becomes is nothing but a, a core propagator here that has a glue on field here. Right. And this becomes one half. This is again the same core propagator that I have here. And then I have this thing here. This is a delta. I mean, uh, it's a trace of an identity. So this is n. So this becomes n over 2 times the core propagator. And then I get minus 1 over 2n the same core propagator. So you see that you get that this is nothing but n squared minus 1 over 2n times this. And this is what we call the, the color factor CF. So you see that you can immediately derive a color factor. So the same way, it's a bit more complicated. Sorry. You can derive the the color factor CA. This one, you can derive that this is nothing but the CA times the propagator. So how do you do it? So here you have these tensors F, A, B, C, here and here, right? So you have first you relate F, A, B, C to the matrices here. So you relate F, A, B, C to this kind of traces. And then whenever you have on both sides, and you see that you, you will have some indices here, F, A, B, C, and here you have again B, C, D. Whenever you have two T, B, and the number T, B, then you use the Fiat's identity. You simplify everything and you can get essentially this out. This essentially generates a lot of theorems, so it's not so easy to do it here. But uh, for instance, you can try to do a, like a little mathematical program or a form program that does this for you, or we can discuss this. So, Julia, there is, a, there is a hand raised. Yeah, okay, perfect. Please. Uh, hello. Um, maybe you already mentioned, but uh, this uh, way of uh, representing the gluons with uh, two directed arrows, uh, so it is totally derivable uh, by only using the fields identity, right? Or there are other rules uh, regarding how to use them. You are referring to this? Uh, yes. Mm, so, no, okay. Mm, if, okay, so here, um, now what, all I wanted to say here is that if you think about the quark, uh, that enters and is somehow in one given color state, say it has color state red, one, zero, zero, then it interacts with one of these gluons. 
So you multiply it by one of these matrices, the effect of this. So if you take, for instance, what I wrote here, this, and multiply it by one of these matrices, you will see that at the end, you have something that is in a different state. So you multiply this by a matrix, uh, one of these, sorry, I have problems with this. Mm -hmm. You will see that what you get out is something that has a different uh, color state. For instance, uh, like this. This is what I wanted to say here. That the effect of this uh, matrices here is effectively a rotation in color space. Uh, I see, but uh, given a Feynman diagram, uh, you are able to replace all the gluons with double lines, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. The way you replace it is using this. Uh, so you when you have gluon interactions, you can replace the Fs with, uh, in essence, okay, this, uh, this relation, if you want to draw it, what this relation means uh, is that if you have F A B C like this, uh, this is equal to this. Uh, Where the arrow goes in a different direction here. So these are this F A B C now. Okay, modular signs and so on. F A B C minus A C B. This is what. Uh, so this identity tells you that essentially you can take this vertex F. And this is what you need uh, to use if you want to prove that uh, C A is equal to three. And you can simplify it in this form, each vertex. And then uh, you see that it, this generates many terms. No, but this, uh, what I, all I wanted to say here is this effect of, uh, if you have something in one color state, if it, it interacts with the gluon, it changes. It rotates, uh, if you want. Thank you. OK. Are there other questions in the? No. No, no. No. Okay, so. Okay, I by far didn't go <laughs> get as far as I wanted to get to, but uh, so what, um, okay, what I'm showing you here now are the full QCD Feynman rules, uh, when you also include uh, the, the rest that you get from the Lagrangian, but, um, I don't know. I realize that I'm a little bit slow in. Uh, in uh... Yeah, it was exactly the same with the card because when you speak at an audience that you don't see. You, yeah, you, you want to be more. more. I write so badly that if I have to try to make uh, things. Do I have another few minutes or not? Uh... Yeah, I mean, you can at least you can go up to 5 p.m. and then uh, if you okay. take five minutes more, I don't think. Okay, okay, so let me, okay, let me be a bit more quick here now. Okay, the, <clears throat> okay, one thing I wanted to say about gauge invariance, maybe I just say it. So in the same uh, way as we have gauge invariance in QED, I already said it is a uh, uh, gauge invariance uh, we also have in QCD, it's a really fundamental property. And it's related to this somehow transformation of, of fields, you know, where you take a psi, you transform it as a U of something Psi. And so the covariant derivatives that we have are called covariants exactly because they are constructed in such a way that they transform as the field. So the mu Psi also transforms as U of X the mu Psi. And this is how why are also called covariant derivatives. And from here, one can derive the transformation for the for the gluon field, and this is by far not really trivial. So for, let me write it down for you simply. This TA transforms as TA prime, that has this form U, TA, A, U, dagger, X, plus I over G, the coupled constant, D mu, U, U minus one of X. Right. So this is by far non-trivial transformation. But then what you can somehow show is that, um, for instance, if you take the field strength tensor, T, T A mu nu, this, uh, you can see that this transforms as U, T A, F mu nu, A, 
più data. And why is that? Well, the simplest one can do a brute force calculation, or you can simply see that F mu nu, in fact, you can write it as a commutator of D mu, D mu, right? If you write it as a commutator, this is D mu, D mu minus D mu, D mu. And then each of these D mu has a U, U dagger. So this here, when you transform, there is a U, U dagger that cancels. So this you immediately see that you will be left with a U on this side and the U dagger on this other side, which is exactly what I wrote here. So then you see that if you take a product of two of this F mu nu, F mu nu, this U, U dagger on the left and right hand side, they will cancel out, you sum over the indices and all these U's go away. So F mu nu, F mu nu in QCD is the age invariant. And the same, these uh, terms, uh, the new psi, these are also the age invariant, right? So this and F mu nu, F mu nu with the synthesis, these are the age invariant. This is, uh, by the way, it's different as in, uh, in QAD. In QAD, you can see that F mu nu alone is gauge invariant. Well, in QCD, you have to really take uh, the, the full uh, square of the product. You also see that, for instance, <clears throat> you cannot write, for instance, a master like this for the, for, for the gluons, because this would violate gauge invariance trivially. And, um, yeah. OK, so. And maybe the last thing I wanted to say about the Lagrangian that maybe is relevant for data is uh, uh, isospin symmetry. So isospin symmetry, isospin is a SG2 symmetry that relates essentially the content of up and down. So isospin invariance means invariance when you change up and down. So you can essentially define this isospin as one half n u bar, the content, minus down minus d bar. So the proton, for instance, has isospin one half. The neutron has isospin minus one half, and they are said to be in the same isospin multiplet. The same is for pi plus, pi zero, pi minus. They have isospin one, and they are also in a multiplet the states. And what happens is that states that are in the same multiplet have very similar masses. And uh, okay, this uh, maybe it's unclear why I discuss this now, but later I think we will use isospin when we talk about um, about uh, pattern distribution functions. But in general, if you take the QCD Lagrangian, you can see that it has this isospin symmetry if up and down have the same mass, and even more so, of course, if the masses, uh, if you set the masses to zero, you see that you have this isospin symmetry. Also, in the limit of vanishing masses, what often happens is that people define these left and right states, uh, P left or P right. So you define these projectors, uh, P left, right, which is one half, one minus plus gamma five. And uh, you can write the, essentially you can write the QCD Lagrangian, let me maybe write it, this is, uh, so you have the sum of the fermions, and then you have this uh, psi L, the new psi L, with this index F always. And then you have the mass theorem, so you have, uh, so somehow masses, uh, what people call about chirality flip terms uh, in this form. Uh, Okay, so you see that if you neglect fermion masses, uh, this Lagrangian, of course, has a much larger symmetry. So it's, it has an SU left, uh, an F, SU right, an F, and then a global U1, and so on. And this is obvious. Whenever you somehow set uh, things to be equal, you can always recover larger symmetries. But this is something we will use later. In, um, okay. And okay, I'm afraid I'm uh, running out of time. Unfortunately, I discussed much less than I wanted. And uh, yeah.
So, I don't know. Other questions so far? Yeah, th there is one question about uh, slides uh, that will be provided. So if you can give some slides, maybe where you have also what you wanted to discuss, but you didn't manage to discuss, uh, maybe they can give a look and tomorrow in the discussion session. Yeah, so what should I do? I mean, uh, maybe we discuss later. I, I'm uh, really a little bit slower if I write and so on. Uh, should I can continue and then, uh, uh, however, in the last lectures, maybe use uh, slides. Then I can go a bit faster. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's not a problem. So maybe they would like to have the, the slides of today where you have written just to look back at the notes that you have taken. So if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have... Okay, I'll send this to you. Yes. If, um, mm -hmm. And we can put them uh, on the Slack, uh, for instance, where, where, where they have access and they. Okay, okay, okay. Are there other questions sir, at the moment? I don't see other questions. I see that there is a maybe a nice remark. Is that the pure blue on the um, up? Okay, then drop is one over two. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. There was a remark about uh, yeah about the fact essentially that let's see. Oh, sorry, what did I write? Here, it's identity here. That this term, this term drops uh, is one over two n. Yeah, so this I know is suppressed, this type of induction. So, in fact, in QCD, many calculations that are very difficult are done in the so called leading color approximation. And then here, one drops this type of, type of terms so that are suppressed by, by color. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I don't see other questions now. So if okay, we're so fine, we can stop here and then tomorrow we'll. Uh, and it's the same Zoom for the discussion session. It's the same Zoom, but it's not recorded. But it's not recorded. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.